welcome to episode 41 of the Stop, Drop, In It podcast. My name is Lisa. I'm coming to you from Long Island, New York. It is December. In case you guys hadn't noticed, I have been doing a ton of recording lately. I have been putting videos up like crazy, um, partly because you guys asked to see a few things, partly because I had so many videos that I recorded on my phone and need to get off my phone so that I have enough space on my phone <laughs> to actually save and then upload a podcast episode. So yeah, um, my storage is pretty, pretty stuffed full. But yeah, so um, there's lots of videos. I put some forage with me videos. I put like a weekend vlog video up there. And yesterday was the start of December. Today is December 2nd. It's Thursday. I'm recording on Thursday because it's not freezing out here and I can just be out in a sweater. So I am um, just, yeah, I'm just recording a lot and I'm having a blast. And I hope that you guys have a chance to watch some of my shorter videos. And I'm kind of excited about blog, blogmas, about vlogmas. I think that I am a little bit intimidated about trying to record every single day, but I am up for the challenge. And like the one that I just put up, I didn't even think I had any great content. And then I think the vlogmas turned out not so bad. So yeah, I think it's just because like I told you guys, we are looking for a place to live. We are in my parents' house. They are moving. The house is in no position for me to be filming very much indoors. It is just not something I want to show the whole world on the uh, YouTube. So yeah, so little snippets here, little snippets there, and hopefully they'll get put together into something that is kind of fun to watch. So I am going to start off with the usual segment because I am wearing a hand knit today. So let's go into what am I wearing? So I am finally, 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 for the first time since I finished it, wearing my Garland pullover. I think it's Garland pullover, Garland sweater, Garland something by Stephanie Lotvin. I test knit this sweater for her. I want to say maybe I started it in March and then the test the test window was quite long because it was like for a holiday sweater. She did release it a few months ago, or I don't even remember when she released it, but um, the pattern is actually available. I just, I remember that there was a few months, like I want to say March and April and May that I was, I was test knitting this. And then it was still several months before she actually released the pattern to the public. So I know that a lot of you guys were interested in knitting the garland pullover. So um, yeah, it is December 2nd. You guys have time to pull this off if you're interested. Um, and if you're not thinking that you have enough time to knit a holiday sweater, but you still want to knit a holiday something or other, Stephanie also just released yesterday a really fun Christmas themed holiday cowl or shawl. I'm not sure if it was a cowl or a shawl. Um, so yeah, I will put a picture of it up here. Also with a the, like the name of the pattern below so that you guys can search for that if you want. It's a really fun, festive design and probably wouldn't take as long to knit as a sweater. So yeah, let me go over the details for you because it has been a while. So I knit this in Barrett Wool Co. Uh, fingering weight, woolen spun, uh, oats. The colorway was oats. So it's like a really rustic yarn that's got like little, little specks of of like, I don't know, tan and it's, it's not like a solid off white. There's definitely specks of things in it. Um, and I love it. And the, um, see if I can get 
a nice close up of the yoke and shoulder design. I used Knitterly Things minis that are sparkly. I don't know, I'm trying to get the uh, sparkle to show up on camera, but those were sock minis that I had just in my stash from all of the sock yarn club subscriptions that I have been getting from her for like three years now or something. So I have a lot of minis just piling up in my stash and uh, these two greens and the red all had like that Stellina base to them. So I thought that that would be a really fun thing to mix in with this more rustic yarn. And then the sleeves just have a little bit of that design. I wanted to kind of do the other color on the other sleeve just for fun, but then I couldn't find it. I lost it. I didn't know what happened to it. So I'm sure it's somewhere because I know that I didn't run out of the dark green, but yeah, so, so they're matching. I was gonna be mismatched, but yeah. So yeah, my garland pull over. Um, let's see. I move the chair a little bit. I'm kind of backed into a corner here today, so I didn't know how much you guys can see. But yeah, I, I knit it kind of regular sweater length, not too long and not too short because I just wanted it to be a sweater that would last me a lifetime. So, just back in here. All right, yeah, so that is Garland Pullover by Stephanie Lotvin. And if any of you actually have knit this since, because I know a lot of you were talking about it, um, leave me a note in the comments. I would love to check out your version of the sweater as well. Okay, so I do actually have a very small finished object for this week, so let's go into finished objects. I need a hat. I love this hat. I wear this hat all the time. If you guys have been watching my shorter videos, you probably have seen this hat already. This is called the Slouchy Farmer's Cap. And this is a pattern that comes for free with the purchase of a single worsted weight skein of Tabitha's yarn over at Long Island Yarn and Farm. So if you guys have been dreaming of her yarn because it is luxury, it has a nice little price tag on it that is worth every single penny, um, her yarn is beautiful. But if you, you know, it can be hard to knit, to want to knit like a sweater quantity of yarn because that's like a really big commitment. So this, um, it was just one skein of worsted weight. And yeah, so I have a little bit of luxury on my head. This is so warm. I think that that's the, one of the things that I love about her yarn the most. Um, the wrap that I made for my mother-in-law. You guys have seen it a few times. I will, I'll insert some pictures to refresh your memory. Um, the classic Hampton wrap, I had done as two versions of it as a sample knit for Tabitha. And then I knit another one for, it was supposed to be a gift for Christmas this year for my mother-in-law. But um, for those of you who don't know, she passed away um, early September. So I have kept it for myself and I have been enjoying wearing it, especially um, when I go out foraging, I have been double wrapping it around my neck and wearing it as a cowl and it is the warmest thing. So yeah, I mean, there is, I think that this is alpaca, merino and silk blend of yarn. This was one, like a one of a kind skein that I got off of her Instagram stories sometime last year. And it's so warm and I really, really like it. I, you know, I, it's a really basic pattern and I had no idea how I was gonna feel about just like a unisex type hat and I really, really like it. So it's got like, just a little bit of slouch. I was running low on yarn, so I did rip like two rows back before I did the decreases again. Like I started to do the decreases and I could see that 
I was not going to have enough yarn. So I just, um, I just ripped back two rows and then started the decreases. So um, it probably has like a little less slouch than, I don't know, but I maybe I did the ribbing a little bit too long too. I kind of sort of measured. I just kind of winged it. So yeah, anyway, one skein of worsted weight yarn. This pattern is only available with the purchase of her yarn. And I don't think, yeah, I don't think that there's a way that you can just purchase the pattern without purchasing the yarn. So yeah, go ahead and check out her shop. I think it's livestock.com, livestock.com. That used to be her business name. So that is her website address. I will stick it here below. I will also link it in the description box below in case you guys just want to treat yourself for the holidays to a single skein of yarn. So I wish I had a little bit more so that I can knit some mitts. I might have a little bit of the, I have a shawl that wrap that I wore last episode that matches this. And I think I have not a full skein of it left, but almost. So maybe I'll try to dig that out and see if I have enough to put together like just a quick little pair of fingerless mitts because I noticed that when I'm out foraging, now that it is cold, that is something that would be very useful to have is fingerless mitts. I don't have any, I just have like mitten mittens and you can't really pick things up off the ground so easily with regular mittens. So, Salchi Farmer's cap, I really love it. So yeah, so that's what I am wearing. Well, that's what I'm wearing right now, but that is my finished object. Um, I forgot, I'll go ahead and stick giveaway information into this segment as well. I will, so we had a one year of Stop, Drop, and It podcast celebration, and I went out and purchased for you guys. So this is not sponsored. I went out and bought this myself to share with one of you. Uh, these two skeins of less traveled yarn and they're so beautiful. So I did not draw a winner yet, but by the time you are watching this, I will have drawn a winner and inserted that information right now. So congratulations, I hope that you enjoy this and please be sure to get in touch with me as soon as you see this at stop, drop, and knit podcast at gmail.com. Just send me an email saying that you won the giveaway and with your address and I will get this out to you right away. And I will also shoot you an email or a message if I, uh, in the comments on that episode, which I think was episode 39. So yeah, I'll get in touch with you. You get in touch with me and let's get this to you. Okay, so next up is whips. I just had a moment of total panic that I wasn't recording because I stopped the uh, video after I said, look, we're gonna go to whips. Sometimes I stop it and sometimes I just like let it go and I keep editing. I just had a moment where I was like, did I, was I recording all of that that I just did? Anyway, okay, whips. <laughs> so since we were just talking about a hat, let's, uh, let's talk about the Muscle Burr hat by Isolde Teague that I have been knitting for my husband for his birthday present. Maybe he'll see it for his Christmas present because this thing is going on and on and on forever forever it's so long I've even got the yarn inside of it you guys see how long this is getting I am still on gauge though so there is no need to rip any of it back so I'm even running out now I'm running out of my yarn as predicted so we'll see how much further I get if I manage to get the whole thing I think I think I have 17 inches now. I think that when I measured this last, we were at 17 inches. So I know that this looks ridiculously long for a hat, right? So um, I know that a lot of you have knit this pattern before and 
in case you haven't, let me explain this because this just looks like a big sack right now, right? So this pattern, the way that it's going to work is that, you know, in another few inches, I'm going to decrease and this will become one single tube of knitting that I don't think I can really demonstrate. Well, maybe I can, let's see. It's gonna get folded into itself a bit, right? So it's gonna get folded into itself and then it's gonna also be long enough to have like a rolled up brim, right? So it's gonna be really warm. It doesn't seem like a fingering weight hat would be that warm, but if you think about it, it's really like a double knit hat and then once I get another, yeah, I can tell actually when you do this, you can tell that I do still need to knit more because I definitely want him to be able to roll up the brim, which also then gives it like four layers around your ears, right? Because you've got a double knit and then rolled up creates like a really nice, cushy, thick layer. So this is coming. I work on it almost almost every day because this this has been my mindless knitting project the only one that I've got going right now and I'm gonna get there we're gonna do it but how beautiful I show you guys all the time how beautiful this yarn is this is the great pumpkin Charlie Brown colorway by knit circus and there's like what it looks like in the skein super fall and pumpkin-y just in time for December but no these are great these are great colors my husband's birthday is November 1st this was supposed to be a birthday present I don't think I even started it before his birthday maybe I did but then I had to rip it out he understands he's a good husband he is knitworthy I should have put this why didn't I do this in the knitworthy segment? I'm losing it, you guys. I am losing it. I keep forgetting about knitworthy. This should be in knitworthy. Anyway, he is very knitworthy. It is still a whip, so we'll just leave it in whips. But he is, it's a knitworthy whip, is what we've got going on here. So maybe it'll be finished by the next podcast don't know I'm definitely if I don't finish it very soon it will probably turn into a Christmas gift so yeah let's see how far I get on it but yeah what's nice about it is I just stick the ball of yarn in here and then I just kind of roll it all up and put it in my bag so it's such a pretty color so I would keep it for myself except he's got a much bigger head than I do so yeah I should knit myself my own muscle burra hat though as you can see though with the one that I showed you just now I went with one that was gonna knit up very quickly because this one was taking so long oh my goodness all right so what should I show you guys next I know what I will show you guys I put the border on my spring thing shawl so I don't even know this must be the right side yeah you can tell from the border so it now has a border on it a nice bright border so I still have to so I did block it um, I don't I don't think I showed it to you guys like last time when I like since I blocked it I don't know but it's looking more like this now I still have to add tassels to it but I'm supposed to block it again before I do that so that might not get done for a while just just being real with you guys like I don't know I just don't seem to have time for blocking things these days we'll see I feel like I already blocked it but I should probably block it one more time I could see it maybe got a little puckery 
not really a little bit over here um the yarn that i used for this shawl was by humble bumble fiber co and i was originally going to make socks with it but then when i saw like the purples and it's called firefly so all of these bright neon specks are supposed to like represent fireflies I just thought that I wanted something to really show off the yarn better than a pair of socks would and so I made a shawl so it still needs tassels it needs to be blocked but it is getting closer to becoming a finished object all right so there's that this is really bright I feel like it almost like wants to glow in the dark I don't think it does but it's so bright but you guys can finally, I think, see the color a lot better than when I was holding it up, like now that it is on the shawl. So, yeah. I have two more project updates for you. Speaking, all right. Speaking of shawls, you guys, I do have a shawlography update for you all this week. I thought I skipped it last week. So let me dig that one out. Okay, so I have started the border and I am loving it so much. I know there are so many of you that don't like this border. It's probably your colors. That's all I'm gonna say because my border and my colors, I think it really does tie it together. So this is what mine is looking like. And you see, this is, this is why I'm so glad that I chose like basically a kind of a gradient because it's they just look so good right it's not like this bold and obnoxious border that so many of you guys I've seen complain about so it's just gonna take forever um, but I really like it so we are though we are getting to the point where the border uh-oh, I did okay, here it is. This shawl is so long that I thought that I lost my needle. All right, we're getting to the point though where we're starting to bind off the shawl. So now I can actually kind of hold up in more detail. I think maybe last time I hadn't quite finished section three. I think I, I had done the brioche, but I had not done these crosses there we go I think you guys can see that maybe if I put my hand no no it doesn't help I'll just do it this thing's awkward okay there we go so that's that cross section there so I think I hadn't shown you guys that last time because I didn't bring this last time because I think I hadn't worked on it all right so that was the end of section three so to recap the sections of shawlography we cast on with color a which i have over here i put them in a different order for the border and i'll tell you why in a minute so it started off so small and innocently with this little cast on there and then this i still think that these wedges that he had us start off with was the most fun to knit these short row wedges and I just love like when this is actually blocked out you'll be able to see all of the different pops of color in there so that was section one and then section two started yeah section two started with this uh, slip stitch section with uh I'm gonna say I think it's stuck yeah it's stuck in that stitch changing colors behind these slip stitch sections and then we had these fun i-cord loops for some texture and then a different type of stripey slip stitch section there and then these welts I think that's what he called it these welts where you actually had to drop a stitch to make them like catch like that that was a little scary but once you like trusted it it was totally fine um, and then there's this triangle 
color work section there. So this was all section two. We're still going with section two. This is why my shawlography is not done because section two went on forever. Because then we had baubles. <laughs> now we're still not done with section two because we had these two huge sections of knitting. So this uh, stripey section there, still section two. Oh, but you, you did it on both sides of the shawl, right? It took forever. It took forever. It was so fun. So then there was, you can see where section three starts in the center of the shawl where that, where this stripey section here, there is a portion in the center where we left the stitches on the needle and then this brioche section, well, there's like this big, um, how did we connect this together? There's like a big, it's hard to see all of this detail without having it blocked yet, but there are these big yarn over holes created to bridge these two sections together. And then section three was this brioche section and this cross stitch section there. And section four is the big, binding off border. So I am not even at the halfway point yet because I think the halfway point of the shawl is right here. If this gives you any idea of how much of the border I still need to do, that's how long I still have to go before the halfway point. I'm gonna hope that I can get this done before Christmas or before the new year, but I think it looks really, really awesome. And I wanna, I just dropped, what did I just drop? Color B, dropped color B. Um, I wanna show you guys the portion that I have done the border, like what that looks like from the cast on there. I mean, this thing is huge. I can't even spread it out and fit it all on the screen. So this little blue tab down here where my thumb is, that was the cast on. <laughs> so that's just, that's just the edge of the shawl. I love it. It's gonna be like a blanket. And I still am a thousand percent in love with my colors. So the only thing that I did differently at all for the border was I just like, chose my colors to go in a specific order I don't I don't remember what he said I think he Stephen said maybe go lightest to darkest is what he was doing but if you guys can see I had these two skeins here which I mean they're obviously different but they're also very similar and I did not want these two to to be right directly next to one another at all so i fussed with my colors a little bit and i got it so that there was like two skeins of my bright solid colors in between but then still this still this skein separating these two which is just enough brightness i think to make them more distinct from one another so that was, wait, where does this go? Here and here and here. That was my thinking for the border. And so, yeah, so you can see I started with, I started with uh, this color down here. And then I just, I went through them. And that is my sequence of all of my colors together. So you can see like these three this is the closest that those two are together. But I think that that purple is still, still gives enough distinction between the two colorways that it works. Oh my gosh, but this, yeah, I just, there's other things I wanna work on too. So while I do wanna get this done, if I only focused on this, this would be the only thing for like the next two or three weeks probably. I mean, maybe not that long, but it's like I'm doing a lot of dyeing and trying to set up my shop and stuff too. So, plus we're going to be looking for a place to live. So I just, yeah, I think my goal is to go through 
each of the five colors every time I knit it to commit to at least doing the five colors of stripes. So I'm not even making myself commit to that for like every single day. You can see I've done one, two, I haven't even done three complete repeats through the colors actually because I think I obviously didn't listen to myself to go all the way through five colors. Well, now I'm gonna have to do five and a bit. I didn't take my own advice. I stopped before I went through the whole sequence because the sequence ends with this one. So I still have, I have two more colors to go. Yeah, so I've done two and three fifths. Lisa, you need to start taking your own advice. Anyway, so I'm super, super excited about shawlography. I love it. Oh my goodness. This is going to be amazing and epic and all of the things when it is done. I would like to get it off the needles before the new year. I think not necessarily Christmas, but before the new year. That's my goal. All right, I've got one more whip and I'm so excited to show you. So let me get rid of all this so that I have room for the next thing. We're also not gonna have a spinning segment today because I didn't do any spinning. My spinning, I've kind of slowed down a little bit with the spinning. I think it might have a little bit to do with the change in weather because I, I do like to, like my spinning to be my sit outdoors and spin and just like enjoy the quiet of the outside. And whenever I've been outside, I've been out foraging. I haven't just come out to sit because the weather's a little cool to just come out and sit. So I just need to get myself set up with like a spinning situation where I don't tuck it away in my bag, but I leave it out so that I see it because I think that that's why I'm not doing it. The spinning it's just that I'm yeah I don't see it and then I kind of forget about it that's what I need to do I need to, to leave it out okay so while I don't have an actual spinning segment for you guys today I do have a project that I am working on with my hand spun yarn which is the most recently finished spun yarn that I did um, here's one of them this was my iris colorway and the fiber is 100% Polworth from Frabjus Fibers. And so I'm on my second little tiny skein of hand spun and I have combined that with some mill ends that I picked up while I was over at Harrisville Designs over the summer. And this one has, I don't know if you can see just that little tint of sea green in the wool it's so pretty it is it's so pretty and i just i love how these are looking together so i cast on oh a little while ago maybe like a month ago now for the junction sweater by andrea maori and i just finished the brioche section and I put it on big needles so I actually can show you guys like the yoke. It looks like a Christmas wreath almost. Like I could just leave this like this and just decorate it with like the rest of my hand spun for like ornaments, right? That would be a little ridiculous, but anyway. So yeah, I wanted to put it on the needles and get, I still have to take the picture, but I wanted to get a nice picture. I always love like having a circular yoke picture. The yoke itself, I have another inch to go on it. I have not tried this on yet. It looks kind of huge, but I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be perfect because this is supposed to be a nice wide neckline. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited for this sweater. I love it. So, ah, uh, that looks so nice. And then it's gonna stretch a little bit more too. So this is how my junction is looking so far. So happy about it. I think actually that I was a little afraid to use my hand spun in a sweater because my hand spun, um, I think you can even probably see if I, just, if I just hold this up, 
I am I'm not very consistent yet I do this all on my drop spindle and you know I've got I've got some thicker bits and I've got <laughs> some thinner bits right there and you know it is it is inconsistent I've got some very thicker bits and I've also got like some very thinner bits right so I was like really wanting to use it as much as possible in a project but I didn't necessarily want to make like another hat right away with my hand spun because the only other project that I have made with my hand spun is my hat and mittens that I had finished right before I started podcasting last year so um, and I love it I love my hand spun hat and I used just the rest of the hand spun on the cuffs of the mittens and then paired it with another solid colored yarn um, and, and they're great I wear them all the time but I wanted to do something different with this hand spun so I was looking for a sweater pattern where I could use it in color work some way also because I knew I was going to need to combine it with something else because I wasn't gonna have enough to just like knit a sweater so I think it actually this type of pattern is actually the perfect thing like a brioche stitch pattern I'm gonna take this off now is perfect to use with such an inconsistent hand spun because of the way that the fabric like it's not you don't I mean you can see in there you can see there's some really thin stitches and then there's some others that are much thicker but it's just all squished up in there and it, and because the colorway also changes so much from the green to the purple and because I paired it with a yarn that is very consistent, I think that that really helps minimize like how obviously inconsistent. I'm, it's imperfect. I'm fine with it being imperfect. I am not an expert spinner. And I think that that also adds to the charm of any garment is for it to be imperfect, right? says the perfectionist i am such a perfectionist but i am through my knitting learning to be super pleased with all my little imperfections but so i i really am thrilled with how this is turning out with the brioche stitch combining the two together because the white stands out or the, the greenish the Harrisville yarn stands out as being the prominent color right and that is very consistent and so then my my hand spun is just kind of like hidden and tucked away in there I think it's perfect I am really really happy with with how this is coming out and so the next part of the, the rest of the sweater still uses the hand spun if you guys have ever knit the Soldotna crop by Caitlin Hunt, blah, blah, blah. the Soldotna crop by Caitlin Hunter, um, that body stitch pattern, it's kind of, I guess you would call it the lice pattern from like Norwegian knitting. It's that kind of idea where you have, where like a few rows are just the solid stitch and then like every fourth stitch is your contrasting color and then it's like spaced out so it's opposite you know it's sometimes it's here the next time it's there and then it's there and, the, and then it's like scattered throughout the, I'll just why am I trying to explain this to you guys when I can just stick a picture in and show you exactly what I mean I am so ridiculous and not thinking anyway so the whole <laughs> the whole sweater is color work but I think that that's really gonna help the hand spun shine in its own special way too just the fact that it's a few stitches scattered throughout the whole sweater here and there so junction by andrea maori one more inch and i'll have the yoke done and then i can split for the sleeves this is becoming my really want to knit on this one all the time pattern so i'm thinking that maybe this and shawlography are gonna be like my two 
main me projects. I do have another sweater that I need to be working on as well. But I, I feel like if I just go with this one for like another week, I can make like a lot of progress on it and at least get to like the sleeve island portion. I would love to have this one finished also by the start of the year. I think that's another goal with this one. Okay, so I think we have two more segments left. We have, I have a really quick surprise acquisition section because I won a giveaway. So we're gonna go into acquisitions and then of course natural dyeing. So my acquisitions were a total surprise. I did not go out and buy anything. I won a giveaway, which never happens. So I am so excited to show you guys this. So it's gonna be a short acquisition. So uh, yeah, probably less than five minutes. So if you guys have been keeping up with all of the videos on my channel lately, you will have seen that I did a vlog of my trip to Tabitha's open house last this past weekend over at Long Island Yard and Farm. So I had my husband do a little bit of Christmas shopping for me there. I do not know. I showed him a few things. I do not know what he picked out. But the way that it works with the giveaways is that depending on how much you spend over there you get like i think you get a ticket for like every ten dollars you spend you get a ticket to like put in a gift thing i think he got me a sweater quantity of yarn he must have because he ended up with 22 tickets so thank you thank you bryce i was not expecting a sweater quantity but yeah so he's like i have all these tickets what would you hope to get she had all of these different um potential prizes and the way that you did it she had a bag like you could put your tickets in for whatever you were hoping to win and so i saw one for a hohi and co bag with some spin cycle yarn tucked in it and i said that's the one i want to win that is the one i don't think i'll win it because i don't win anything you guys the last time I won anything was also a really amazing prize. It was when I was engaged to Bryce, we were planning our wedding and we went to a wedding expo at the place where we were getting married in Port Jefferson at Danford's. And you know, they go through all the prizes. I wasn't, we weren't winning anything, which was not at all surprising because we never do. And then the very, very last prize was the biggest one, and it was a two-night stay at Danford's, which is the place we were getting married at. And so we were able to have a little staycation, just, you know, out of the house for a couple of nights. And yeah, it was amazing. So, but that was eight years ago. I've been married for eight years, and that is the last time I won anything, right? So this does not happen. So you guys are gonna be like, eyeing this bag and this spin cycle and thinking how lucky I am. And yes, I am so lucky because I, I, some people just win things all the time. I don't. Maybe you have to enter more things if you want to win more things. I also tend not to enter a whole lot of things. That could be why I don't win so many things. Anyway, so all 22 tickets we put in the Hohi Co bag and I won. We shook it up like he put like half the tickets in he had Owen shake it up he put like all the rest of the tickets in he had Owen shake it up and then Tabitha shook it up and then Jill drew a ticket and one of my 22 tickets was the one that Jill picked so thank you Jill I'm so happy and thank you Bryce because this was an extra Christmas present that was totally unexpected so Hohe & Co is Hohe Locatelli's company and she designs these beautiful bags. And look at this bag. You guys, this is real leather. This is shiny and pink. Hello, I love pink. It's not purple, but pink and teal and purple are my favorites. So let me show you guys this bag. 
Oh yeah, there's also a spin cycle in there. We'll get to that in a minute. Oh my goodness, so this is, you'll see if you watched my vlog, you'll see this in the vlog, but you know, it's a nice big bag, right? And it's got, so it's, 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 it's beautiful leather. I have never had this kind of, this is amazing. I, I don't, I don't splurge on myself like this. But, so there is a nice big pocket in the front. There is also a nice big, smaller pocket, smaller big pocket inside. And then inside was also um, a pattern. I want you guys to go check out knitarainbow.com. I got a pattern, a I'm not going to flip this over because there is a code for my free pattern that I can get from her. So Kimberly McAllendon, I think she's the one that put this bag together. And the reason that she is knit a rainbow is really sweet. I'm going to read this to you. It's, it's really sweet. During my mother's final days, I was knitting a shawl in a pretty gray yarn. My mother closed her eyes, smiled and said, Honey, when life is hard and days are gray, knit a rainbow. So she said that those words changed her life and knit a rainbow was born. And so she wants us all to create and knit things that bring us joy. So, and you guys know, so she lost her mom. Tabitha recently lost her mom. My husband lost his mom very recently. So everybody's losing their moms, that sucks. But. I'm going to definitely check out knitarainbow.com and I want you guys also to do that. And I got this little, um, try to get in here, there was a little enamel pin that was included in here as well with, with her logo there. So I am so grateful for this bag and for the pattern, which I haven't, I haven't had a chance yet to go and look on the site and choose a pattern, um, but I'll make sure that when I do that, I let you guys know. So you can see Hohe's logo right there, Hohe and Co. And let's talk about the Spin Cycle yarn that was included too. So Spin Cycle also is like something that would be a very special purchase for me because it's pricey, and you know not. It's not the most affordable, not the most affordable. That project bag that I just showed you guys, also not the most affordable. They're beautiful. So I am like beyond grateful that I won these things. Um, so this is Dyed in the Wool by Spin Cycle. And this is the unicorn colorway, which obviously is right up my alley. I mean, look at those pinks and purples and blues, right? So it is, two skeins and the unicorn is spelled E-W-E, -E, unicorn. So unicorn, right? So a nice play on words there. And so I think every, it's a sport weight yarn that often is paired with fingering weight. I've used Spin Cycle just a couple of times before. Um, I have a little bit in my stash, but not a lot. So, and the Spin Cycle that I have in my stash doesn't look anything. It's not even close to this colorway too. So I'm just really excited. Each is 200 yards of a super, 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 super wash sport weight yarn. So those are my acquisitions. I, I am so grateful. Never, I mean, I was hoping to win, but I never expected to. So thank you, Tabitha. Thank you, Kimberly. I am, I am just blown away and I'm so grateful and excited. Okay, so that is all the acquisitions I have and we are going to head on over to probably my favorite segment, natural dyeing. I have a lot of good stuff to show you guys today. I have so much yarn to show you guys and they're such fun colors. Oh my goodness. All right, we're gonna start with the yellow because I've shown you guys so much yellow yarn, but this yellow yarn I'm hoping is really special actually. Um, so on one of my foraging videos, I think maybe number two, I found a mushroom and I don't remember the scientific name for it, but the 
mushroom itself, they are called sulfur tufts. And what's really fun about this mushroom, I'll put a picture in so you guys can see while I'm talking about it. What's really fun about the sulfur tuft mushrooms is they were the very first mushroom that Miriam Rice, who started this whole dying with mushrooms trend in the 70s, I think, or the the very first mushroom that she experimented with was sulfur tufts. And now I don't know whether she knew this other fun fact about the sulfur tuft mushrooms, but they are bioluminescent mushrooms. And now I have not gotten to try this out yet with my yarn. They are supposed to be UV sensitive black light sensitive they glow and from what I have seen other people do when they die with the sulfur tuft mushrooms the yarn glows in UV light so I have four skeins I have I feel like I have a little bit more than is this one one no it's not I don't know if I have more, I can't remember now if I have more than these four skeins. I think it might just be these four skeins. Um, and it's two different, it's two different bases. I have, I have one on a singles. So like, I know these yellows on camera do not show up well, but I mean, I think you can see the way that the light is hitting it. There's a little bit of a glow to it. So this is my singles base, and then I have three on my sock yarn base, which is, um, so this one is 100% merino wool. And this one is, and it's non-superwash. None of my yarns are superwash. Um, and th so this one is 80% merino and then 12% recycled nylon. So that is what is in these two bases. Can you guys see that yellow? I'm hoping that you can at least a little bit tell that it is yellow. I cannot wait. I need to go get a UV light so that I can see the glow because I can't imagine it wouldn't have worked because for everybody else it works. And then what's really cool, I'm going to insert, I'm going to insert some pictures of things that people have knitted up, what they look like in regular light and then what they look like under a black light because this is not the only dye mushroom that is uv sensitive i think um there's not necessarily a list compiled yet of which ones react to the uv light so as i dye with things and come across uv sensitive mushroom dyes i will definitely be making note of that because it's so cool it is so cool this natural dyeing thing just continues to amaze me and blow me away, especially mushrooms, especially mushrooms. We are kind of nearing the end of mushroom season though, as we are getting into winter. So yeah, so these, once I get a UV light, oh, maybe I can get one before this podcast goes up. I don't know. I just, I need to know what these look like under the UV light. But this is one of like the most stable UV dyes. So I'm just, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it worked. So that is the first exciting thing I wanted to share with you was my UV sensitive dye. So probably what I'm gonna do is make mini skeins, maybe not with the singles, but make mini skeins out of, out of these so that I can spread the UV love a little bit further. So I think that these three if I turn these three into mini skeins, I should have about 15 mini skeins of UV sensitive light. So we'll see. I still am making decisions on what to do, how to divvy this all up. All right, so that's the first exciting thing. Um, now this was really, really cool. This, I don't know whether these are going to go in the shop or not. I only had enough of this mushroom to do these three skeins and it really mostly only worked with these two this one got just enough color for it to like coordinate really well with these so 
I, over the summer, had found a type of coral mushroom. And I did not know at the time that I collected it that if you dye, it only works with an iron mordanted yarn, right? So most of the time you're gonna mordant with alum and then use iron as a modification, as a color modifier in like an after dip after. After it's already dyed, you can change the color that way. Something that I've not yet really played around with though is pre-mordanting my yarns with iron instead of alum. And I might have to do it a little bit more. You just have to be really careful though with the amount of iron because the iron, if you leave the yarns in the dye bath too long, then the iron can start to kind of wear down the wool a little bit. So you just have to be really careful with it but you get beautiful results. And so I found this unassuming coral mushroom. I will try to insert a picture of it here so that you guys can see how you would never ever expect this mushroom to produce purple, a purplish gray, like ever. Some people have managed to get very deep shades of purple with this mushroom. The amount that I had collected, not knowing about the purple, was just not a significant enough of mushroom to have that uh, saturated a dye. So I was only able to get a very pale color of purple. It's like a lilac. I hope that you guys can see it. It is very subtle and it is variegated. Um, there are spots that have picked up a little bit more of the purple and spots that have picked up a little bit less of the purple. So I put these in separately for like 10 minutes each after they were already um, mordanted, but there was also iron in the dye bath too. So I didn't want to just leave them in the dye bath for more than just getting the color. Once I figured that mm, I wasn't going to get much more color onto that yarn, I pulled it out. Um, and I love it. I mean, purple is my favorite. It's really, really subtle. So yeah, now that I know that I can get purple from that mushroom, the next time it's in season, which won't be for several months, probably the summer is when I think it starts popping up again. So next year I will really be looking out for the coral mushrooms because the purples that I have seen some people get you just you need such a large quantity and i just had only collected a little bit not knowing um and then this one there's you're not going to be able to see this on camera it's it's not an undyed skein like there's definitely color on it but it's definitely mostly mostly a very light gray with maybe like parts that have just a tiny hint of purple so i thought that i could use it together with with these two and then I tried to I tried to do two more skeins but I just didn't get any color at all on them the dye bath was exhausted so this is it for the season so yeah I'm not sure I mean it's so subtle not sure it's gonna go up in the shop but I was really excited about it the purple I guess can kind of be hard to get too so I was excited that it worked considering I had so little of the mushroom but you guys will be super pleased with me. Super pleased with me because I found more Cortinarius. Oh, I'm dropping it. I found more of the Cortinarius semi sanguineous mushrooms, a bunch more. And I was able to get all of these colors. And I still have a little bit more. I've got like one more dye bath full. full one more dye bath quantity of mushrooms, of this kind of mushroom in the freezer. So I have all of these gorgeous shades of pinkish, peachish coral that now I definitely feel like I could share it with you guys because I 
yeah, I have more than like the two skeins I think that I showed you last time. So I don't feel like I have to be so super selfish with it. I think I can, I can share. So definitely a lot of this is going to be turned into mini skeins and paired probably together and maybe with some other of the mushroom colors into some sets. But yeah, let me show you. Um, I'm trying to think how I did it. I think these two and not that one, those two and this one I think went all together. All right, so the first dye bath that I made, I, um, I put two skeins of yarn in, which the very first time I dyed with it, I only put one skein in because I had no idea like how much color I was going to be able to get. So I put, and I think I took some video of, of when I skeins these up, so I can maybe insert some of that as well. But I got two very similar looking skeins in the one dye bath. Um, so there are some spots that are a little bit more on the pinkish tone side. There are some that are a little bit more on the peachy tone side. So pretty. I should just back away and let you guys just see the yarn. And so this one is also very similar. So I did both of these I did on my sock yarn base because I wanted to be able to make minis and put some of these into like sock sets for you guys. So I got those two out of the first dye bath. And then I think that this is the one that was the exhaust. So you can see like it, it's got, it's definitely peach. It's definitely not a bare yarn, but you can see it best. You can see it best in person, but you can see it best when it's like paired together with those. Um, so, and then what I did, is this the second or the third one? I think what, what I did next, okay, I'm just trying to sort out how I did this. <laughs> what I did next was I did another dye bath from scratch and I put only, oh, that's what I did for this one. Okay. I heard, all right, so you see this mushroom the underside of the cap, so I'll put a picture of it and so you can see the gills on it are like a reddish, a reddish. And then the stem has a lot of yellow in it. And so the research that I've been doing is that you can get more reds if you just use the caps and then it, you can just use the stems on their own to get more of a yellow. So up until that point, what I had been doing was just putting the whole mushroom in together, which is why I'm getting all these gorgeous, like coral, peachy, pinkish kind of tones, because it's like the red and then the yellow kind of are blending together. So I wanted to see like what kind of color I could get if I just, just did the caps alone of the mushrooms. And I also put just one skein of yarn in because I was interested to see like how saturated a color it was going to be. And so I put in, maybe I had two, I, I had two skeins in. I did have two skeins in. I had in these two skeins. And what's interesting about this is that, all right, so this is a different base. This is my 50% um, Merino, 50% tensile, I think. So it's like half plant based. And I did not mordant this one. I wanted to see like what would happen if I just put an unmordanted skein in. And it turned out beautiful. And the, um, there's a nice amount of sheen in this base that comes out. So this one, um, yeah, this one went in at the same time as this one. But this one picked up so much more color because it was mordanted and this one was not. So this one definitely is more on the pink side than the orange side, but it is still has a lot of variegation to it. You can, you can really see those tones. So it's not red. I haven't been able to get like a red yet, 
and it's not really full on pink, although we have something really similar. And then this is a different base, but so these two were in together. So I've got those. Okay, and then next what I did was I put in, I'm trying to remember what I did. I think I put just one skein in. This would have been the first after bath. That's what I did. I did just one skein um, because I wasn't sure because this had so much color in it that I wasn't sure how much color was left in the dye bath. So I just put one skein in and this is on my singles and this came out super pink, right? So this is the exhaust bath from just the caps of the mushrooms. And you can really see how pink this one turned out. So this is a different base. This is my 100% merino. This is mixed with nylon. And this is the first dye bath. And then this was the first after bath. So those two together, you wouldn't use these two together because of, they're so different, I don't think. But um, I, mean, I wouldn't anyway, but those are the colors together. So the initial dye bath and then how much color was still left in it. And then I put these two into that exhaust bath. So by then I figured I wasn't gonna get that much color out of it still, but I wanted to see, um, they, they come beautiful, these exhaust baths, like especially with this mushroom, like you put the yarn in and it for the longest time, it doesn't even look like any colors going onto the yarn. But then with time, with the heat, with a little bit of heat, but then with the sitting overnight and cooling down, somehow in that process with this particular mushroom is the time when the color finally goes into the yarn and then the water looks like really clear. And so it wasn't looking like anything was happening at all. But then I woke up in the morning and I had the two most beautiful, super pale colors. So this is the singles. And this one has a lot of pink spots to it. So it's like, it's very, very, very subtle, but definitely it has pink. So that was you know, that one would go really nicely with this one together. So these are both singles. So probably those two would be paired together. And then um, this one was, I don't know, it looks, it kind of looks just bare, but it has like the faintest amount of peach to it. So I think that probably I think probably you could see like if I paired it with one of the darker ones you could probably see that it has a little bit of that peachish tint to it so I, I am having so much fun you guys probably want to know when you guys can get your hands on all of this mushroom dyed yarn and yeah soon um, going to be kind of cutting back on the dyeing now, cutting back on the foraging now that it is getting quite cold out there. I'll probably try to still do some, but I, yeah, I am at the point now where I think I have a nice variety of colors and a nice variety of bases, and I have brought all my yarn upstairs, and I'm going to lay it all out together. I'm going to separate it by base so that I can see, like, what I have because right now it is all in my head and I haven't yet just like put it all together in a big gigantic pile to just look at it and figure out which ones I want to sell individually as a one of a kind which ones I want to pair with something else which ones I want to do a sock set like a full skein with a mini um, and then which I just want to turn into mini skein sets so that is the next thing that has to happen. My husband just designed a very basic little tag for me and I should get those in a few days, middle of next week, I think he said. So I am hoping maybe in another 10 days by mid-December, maybe by like the 12th 
ish. Maybe, maybe like that Monday that, um, yeah, maybe one more week in a little bit. I mean, today's Thursday. So by the time you guys are seeing this, it'll be Sunday. So I think, I think like maybe the Monday after the following Sunday, so maybe eight days from when you were watching this, I think tentatively. So, all right. I feel like this has been a really, really long episode today. I didn't feel like I had that many things to show you guys. And then somehow I still did. So, I, I always feel like I have, I have enough to talk about for like maybe 30 minutes and then it's like more than double that. But thank you guys so much. I also, should I should really say like, I have noticed like an uptick in my subscribers over the last week. So if you guys are new, thank you for finding me. Welcome and thank you for subscribing. I'm really glad that you're here. And of course, I know that I have, most of you guys are just, have been loyal and have been with me like from the beginning. And so just, I'm so grateful to all of you who have made this first year just feel like something really good. It feels really good in my heart to sit down and talk to you guys about all of these different aspects of the fiber arts that I do and feeling like I have this little community of people who, who just get it and who enjoy what I'm doing. And yeah, so I'm super grateful. When you guys uh, give me a thumbs up and a comment, it really helps my videos. Uh, reach more people so thank you guys who have been commenting and and giving me thumbs up so if you're not already subscribed and I hope that you will subscribe and yeah thank you guys so much I hope that you enjoyed this episode and I, I'll be looking forward to all the vlogmas videos so you guys get to see a little bit more of just like the day-to-day -day in those and yeah I, I think it'll be fun so until next time, bye.